See the amount of times I've tried to start this video and there is like massive big lorries going right up my street. I've said this intro about 1600 times. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. What is that, T-Rex? Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all well. We have survived another week of this chaos and I am ready to sit down with you guys and talk about yet another case. Let me just center myself right here. It's starting to get to that point in the year where you need to sleep with your window open, which doesn't sit well with me as someone who's absolutely terrified of anything with more than two legs. So the safest option for me is just not to open my windows so that I don't risk anything crawling over me in the night that is not my cat. Therefore, it is like an actual sauna in here, like I am dying. So if you see my face go from relatively matte to greasy by the end of this video, please mind your business. I do not need to know about it. So I just want to start off right away by warning you that this week we are back to talking about a uh, murder of a child again. So if that is something that triggers you, that is too upsetting for you and something you just don't want to hear about, then please, this is your cue to just leave this video now. This week we're going to be talking about the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne. Now this case took place in July. 2000 so there's a high chance that some of you will remember this it was really really widely covered in the news I think in the summer I was only four no I was three years old when this happened so I admittedly have no recollection of this being on the news or anything like that but I have heard of it since since I've gotten a little bit older it is a case that people in this country still talk about all the time people in Britain still talk about all the time so like I've already said this case does mention the murder and assault of a young eight-year-old girl so if that's not something you want to listen to again don't I would ask you if you've not already subscribed to my channel to please do so and if you can give this video a big thumbs up it really really helps me out. So with all of that being said let's get into this week's case. This is the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne. Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne was born on the 13th of October 1991 in Surrey in England to her parents Sarah and Mike. Yeah so just to reiterate that we've got the little girl Sarah and her mum was called Sarah just in case that gets confusing. Sarah had two older brothers Lee and Luke and a younger sister called Charlotte so it was a family of six with four young children. The kids mum Sarah would later say that life could be a little bit chaotic with such a big family consisting of such young kids but for the most part they all got on and they were really really happy. On Saturday the 1st of July 2000, Sarah and Mike took their four children to Sussex to see their grandparents for the weekend. So from oldest to youngest at this point, the oldest child Lee was 13 and then you had Luke who was 11 at this point, Sarah herself was 8 years old and the youngest Charlotte was 6 at the time of this family trip. The grandparents the kids were going to visit that weekend were their paternal grandparents and their names were Leslie and Terence. Leslie and Terence lived in a house that was right beside Kingston Gorse Beach. Literally their house was like a stone's throw away from this beach. It was like every child's dream. It was beautiful. So the four children along with their parents Sarah and Mike arrived at Mike's parents house and they all had dinner together all eight of them before taking a walk along the beach. Sarah, Mike, Terence and Leslie so the four adults had all heard about this house that was getting done up local to the area. The four of them decided that they really wanted to pop along and see the progress that was being made on this house. You know something that you can understand as you get a little bit older is actually an interest thing but obviously for the kids they had no interest in that it sounded very boring like such a waste of time and they were having such a good time playing on the beach that they they asked if they could stay there if you're between the age of 6 and 13 you're going to much rather want to play on a beach with your siblings than go and stay at a house with some adults so with the oldest brother lee being 13 at this time the parents agreed that the kids could stay on the beach on the basis that lee would be left in charge of everybody leaving the kids on this beach was not something that ever really caused concern for the parents or the grandparents of these kids. The beach was literally a stone's throw away from the grandparents house. There were four of them and they weren't going to be left unsupervised for long. So really nobody thought anything of it and the four adults went away and left the four kids right where they were playing on the beach just across from the grandparents house. Now on their own the children continued to play on the beach for a little while but eventually they kind of moved over to an area that was more behind the grandparents house but still very very close. It was a big massive cornfield and the kids thought this would be ideal for play and hide and seek because of the big 
tall grass that was in this field. At some point whilst playing in this cornfield with her siblings, eight-year-old Sarah Payne fell over and cut her knee, which is quite a traumatic thing to happen when you're eight years old. I have many memories of falling and skinning my knees on concrete and it absolutely <laughs> feels like the worst thing in the world at the time. So Sarah was obviously upset, all she would have wanted was her parents, but all she had was her 11 and 13 year old brothers and they weren't going to offer the same kind of support and sympathy that her parents would have offered. In fact, they didn't at all. Sarah was crying crying, she was upset, she was annoyed, she wasn't really getting any sort of positive attention from her brothers and in fact 11 year old Luke actually told her to just go away if she wasn't happy. She had clearly cut her knee, she was upset, she was annoyed, he just told her to go back to the house. So that is exactly what she did. Eight year old Sarah turned around and started walking back on her own to her grandparents house. This is when the older brother, 13 year old Lee, kind of remembered the responsibility that he had been given over his siblings and he actually went to go after Sarah. As Lee was going after Sarah, Sarah. He really wasn't far behind her but he did keep turning his head back to check on his other two siblings, Charlotte and Luke, to make sure that they were okay as well. Lee ran after Sarah down this path towards the grandparents' house and the only time he lost sight of her was when she disappeared through this little gap in the hedges that you had to go through to get to the grandparents' house. Lee was only seconds behind his sister but when he came to this gap himself and went through it, she was nowhere to be seen. Lee went to his grandparents' house thinking that she might have just really, really went for it and managed to get there really, really quickly. So he went there fully expecting her to be there and she wasn't. The only people that were there were his grandparents, Terence and Leslie. Lee asked the grandparents if they had seen Sarah, to which they said no, they had literally only just got back. And then sure enough, a couple of minutes later, Sarah and Mike, the kid's parents, also arrived back at the house. Lee asked them the same question, have you seen Sarah anywhere? And they said, no, she's supposed to be with you, you're supposed to be looking after her. Charlotte and Luke also eventually made their own way back to the house. So now everybody was in the house except for Sarah and nobody had seen and nobody knew where she was. Because Sarah had cut her knee, everybody initially thought that she had just gone off somewhere, she was sulking and she wanted to just kind of hide for a little bit and wait it out, but that she wouldn't be too long. The family then decided to split up and go and look for her and the kid's father, Mike, went back to the cornfield to search. Terence went down to the beach to see if she had returned there, maybe she had got lost and that was the only place she knew how to get her way back to. And Sarah took Charlotte and walked back and forth down the path that connected the cornfield to the grandparents' house just to see if she was there anywhere. Meanwhile, Leslie, the children's grandmother, stayed at the house just in case she was maybe there hiding or she wandered back at some point. It would be good to have somebody there. So the family really covered all bases, but there was still absolutely no sign of Sarah anywhere. The family then took their car and went into the main village to see if they could see her there anywhere. And they even asked a couple of locals, you know, have you seen this little girl? She's blonde, she's my daughter, we've, we've lost her. But nobody else had seen her. And at this point, this is when serious alarm bells went off and the family actually called the police. The police responded very, very quickly and they actually arrived at the property within 15 minutes of being called out and began asking the family a series of questions and looking for Sarah initially around the property. By midnight that night, a hundred police officers had been called to the area to assist in the investigation. It was a very high priority case. The grandparents' house was searched from top to bottom just in case she was hiding somewhere and locals were urged to check their sheds and things like that just in case Sarah had gotten lost. She was quite a shy little girl. So just in case she had gotten lost and she was just hiding somewhere. So it was at this point that 13 year old Lee actually came forward with a very key piece of information that he hadn't mentioned up until this point. He said that when he was running after Sarah, that just around the time that she disappeared through the little gap in the hedges, he had seen a white van drive right past him. Lee said that this van was very squeaky when it drove and that it was being driven by a very scruffy, dirty looking older man. Lee said that this older man caught his eye as he was driving past him and he gave him a really sinister smile and waved at him. This is when this case took a turn from a suspected young girl who had gone missing in an area that was unfamiliar to her to an abduction. The search for Sarah Payne continued all through that night but no trace was found of her at all. After hearing the information that Lee had to offer about the van, police decided to look into known sex offenders in the area and this is when police went to the property of a known paedophile whose name was Roy Whiting. Roy Whiting disclosed to police that he had recently purchased a white van matching Lee's description. However, he told police that he had not been in that area the day Sarah disappeared. He said that he had been out of town in a place called Hove attending a 
a funfair. Police just had this gut feeling that Whiting's behaviour was very, very odd. So after they had questioned him at his house, they made out like they were leaving, but they actually hung about for a bit. As they were hidden in the front of his property, just kind of waiting to see if they could see anything else suspicious, Whiting actually came out of his house with no knowledge that they were there and went rummaging in the back of his white van. Unbeknownst to Roy, a receipt actually fell out of his van while he was doing this and he closed the van, locked up and went back into his house without even knowing this. The police seized their opportunity and they went over and grabbed the receipt. When they read the receipt, they could see it was a receipt for petrol and the petrol had been bought the day previous, so the day that Sarah had been abducted, and it was from a place called Buck Barn Garage on the A24, which is nowhere near where Whiting had claimed to be the day before. Police immediately went to search Roy Whiting's van and what they found inside was a trove of very disturbing items. In the back of this van, police found cable ties that were linked together to form a pair of makeshift handcuffs. They also found a condom, baby oil, ropes, knives and sweets. Obviously this is a very worrying thing to find in the back of a grown adult man's van, especially one that has been acting so suspicious, but there was nothing to directly link him to Sarah Payne. Roy Whiting was actually taken into custody, but because there was such a lack of evidence, they had to release him 48 hours later. Other known sex offenders in the area were questioned in their hundreds, but there was absolutely nothing to link any of them to this little girl. The search for Sarah continued for a couple of weeks, and at this point it was very, very extensive. They were searching bodies of water, they had helicopters, it was just there was a lot going on trying to find this little girl. The family were making public appeals for information, and this case gained a lot of traction very, very quickly. Everybody knew about it. Many people, including particularly the kid's mum, Sarah, were very confident that Sarah was going to turn up alive. So much so that the Payne family actually had a bag of Sarah's things ready to go to take with them when Sarah did turn up. I mean, I'm sure everybody already knows the outcome of this case, but that detail in particular is really, really heartbreaking. So just less than three weeks after Sarah Payne went missing, the body of a young girl was found in a field. This field was just 15 miles away from Kingston Gorse Beach, where the children had been playing. The following day, on the 18th of July, these remains were officially confirmed as those of Sarah Payne. She had been found by a farmer who was out pulling weeds up out of his field, and he spotted what he initially thought was a dead animal and this location was only three miles away from the petrol station that Whiting's receipt placed him at that day. There was no forensic evidence to directly link Sarah Payne's body to anyone and thankfully no evidence of sexual assault but that's not to say that this didn't happen as she was found with no clothes on. Sarah and Mike had initially gone to identify their daughter's body bearing in mind she had been lying in a field decomposing for three weeks that is not something that anybody really wants to see and that's exactly how Sarah Sarah felt she wasn't sure she wanted to see her daughter this way so Mike went in first to have a look at her and then he would come out and describe it to Sarah and let her make up her mind if she wanted to come and see her daughter herself. Mike went into the room and when he came back out he was white as a sheet and he was clearly in shock and from that alone Sarah decided that she didn't want her last memory of her eight-year-old daughter to be that. Not long after being initially questioned by the police, Roy Whiting went to go and live with his father in a place called Crawley. So this is where he was when her body was discovered. Three days after her body was discovered, a shoe was found in around about the same area that was confirmed to belong to Sarah Payne. This was a Velcro shoe, so many, many things stick to Velcro. It's a very good substance for collecting DNA evidence and right enough the velcro on the shoe contained fibres from the clothes that Sarah Payne was wearing that day and also fibres from the clothes that Roy Whiting was wearing. On the same day that this shoe was discovered and that it was made public knowledge that this shoe was discovered Roy Whiting stole a car in the area of Crawley where he was living with his dad and a police chase ensued at 70 miles an hour. Whiting ended up crashing this stolen car during the police chase and he was subsequently jailed for 22 months for dangerous driving. It was during this time that police carried out proper forensic analysis of Whiting's van and that is when they found further DNA evidence to link Sarah Payne to the back of this van. It was also found that he had purchased this van literally only one week before Sarah was abducted. On the 6th of February 2001, Roy Whiting was charged with the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne. Whiting went on trial and was found guilty of abduction and murder. He was jailed at HM Prison in Wakefield for 
life with a minimum of 50 years, but Roy Whiting actually appealed this and got his sentence reduced to life with a minimum of 40 years. This means that Roy Whiting could be out and living back within society in his 90s. During his trial, it was also made public knowledge that Roy Whiting had previous convictions for assaulting a nine-year-old girl way back before Sarah Payne, for which he only served four years in prison. But this was on his record. This was something that had already been known about Roy Whiting. And he had been freed to do it again, and that is exactly what he did. Roy Whiting has had a very difficult time in prison and has been attacked on numerous occasions. He has been slashed across the face with a piece of broken glass by a fellow inmate, leaving a six inch scar down his face, and he has also been stabbed in the eyeball. He was also stabbed on the body on a separate occasion, but he has recovered from all three of these attacks and he continues to live in prison. In 2011, Sarah's law was passed and this made it so that parents were able to be notified if there are known sex offenders in areas local to them by giving public controlled access to the sex offender registry. This means that anyone is free to access the register and see if there are any sex offenders living in areas that they are moving to or even just visiting. Sarah's parents say that had this been a thing before they even went to go and visit their grandparents that they would have known that there was an active sex offender living in the area because of the previous convictions that this man had. In 2003, Sarah and Mike, the kid's parents, separated and Mike unfortunately went on to become an alcoholic. What happened to his daughter completely consumed him and he just never recovered from it. Remember as well, he actually went in to see his daughter's body that's got to be traumatising. And unfortunately, in October 2014, Mike was found dead inside his apartment due to no suspicious circumstances, but it is said that he just succumbed to an alcohol-related illness. And that is everything for me this week on the story of Sarah Payne. This is such a sad case. It really, really was. And the fact that Sarah's law has now passed is such a good thing, I think. But I think it has always lived in Sarah's head that had this been a thing before they even took that trip, that maybe this could have all been avoided. But I suppose the saving grace there is that she could really be saving a lot of children in future by campaigning for this law to be passed. The fact that Roy Whiting had committed sexual assault against a nine-year-old girl previously and he was only locked away for four years and then remained free to do it again is really, really infuriating. There was a point where they had this guy, they didn't need to let him go again. I think the punishment for assaulting a child should be way, way higher than just four years. Had that been dealt with properly, then this would never have happened to Sarah Payne either. So it's just, it's such an infuriating and just upsetting case. It really, really is. But anyway, I just want to say a massive thank you for watching me yet again. Um, I will be back next week with another true crime case and until then have a lovely, lovely week and I will see you soon. Bye. I don't have an outro song so just have me singing instead.